In order to maintain lasting peace, you have to prepare for war. And the fundamental thing that side and opposition cannot understand in today's debate is that we allow every single sovereign nation in the world to allow and decide exactly how they should go about that. And in the face of a constitutional limitation that suffocates the state's innate duty to protect its people, we are happy to be against that. And we tell you that this undermines the will of the Japanese people. We tell you this doesn't allow for the prevention of any existential threats in Japan. We tell you that this undermines the superpower relationships that Japan maintains with other countries like the United States. We are proud to propose. Three questions I'm going to ask. First of all, do we uphold the state's rights to protect itself? Second of all, do we prevent any existential threats and maintain lasting peace and security? And thirdly, how do we better the relationship with countries like the United States? So answer the first question of do we uphold the rights of the state, right? What we clearly told you from the beginning is that we would only pursue this policy in the event when a two-thirds constitutional, like, majority exists in parliament and when a referendum reflects the popular will of the people to support this policy. Side opposition cannot force us to defend a situation where this doesn't exist. Because we say that even if it's unlikely, our burden in today's debate is to only support this policy where those frameworks do exist, where that existing rhetoric is in that scenario. We say that you can't force us into defending this burden. But secondly, what side proposition fails to understand is the context of Japan, right? Because we say that yes, they do have a culture of being a pacifist nation, a nation that wants to embrace concepts like peace. But we say that at a point in which the Japanese public is willing to override constitutional things that it holds sacrosanct, such as peace, it means that the security faces security threats it faces must be genuine, must be real. And we say that in that scenario, that's because of the exist like the rise of China. That's due to things of North Korea being present in that situation. But let's ask ourselves, do we allow for the state to fulfill its fundamental and innate duty, right? Because we say that every single state should try to create conditions where its people don't feel threatened, where its people feel like they are safe and they can pursue its rights. Side opposition was supposed to prove to us in today's debate why a state should retroactively do that, why states should only ever retroactively respond to threats once they are there, there. And we say that is something that's fundamentally illegitimate because the state should always, in every situation, try to create the safety of its people before the threats are there, to try and create conditions where the threat isn't even likely to occur in the first place. And that is something that we achieve with this policy, right? So, Let's understand what exactly they said, because they said that Japan shouldn't pursue this policy because it still has the backing of states like the United States that will fill in and come to the safety and protection of Japan. So we need to look at the double standard of side opposition in today's debate, right? Because if they recognize a sovereign state like the United States having the legitimacy to militarize in Japan, having the legitimacy to militarize in East Asia, why can't they recognize the sovereign legitimacy of Japan as that very state defending its own people? That is something that we say is legitimate for Japan to pursue. That is the fundamental mandate that the state has an innate duty to protect its own people, right? And then we say, secondly, they've con like constantly mischaracterized the, like the, the, the relationships between China and Japan because they seem to suggest that China is going to be threatened by Japan remilitarizing. They're going to view this as an act of aggression. And we say that's not China's discrepancy and grievance with Japan. We say that China is completely like against Japan based on numerous things, things such as their World War II history, things such as their failure to admit that they played a role in that. We say that China, as a country, especially considering that we're talking about China, as a China is a country that respects a state fulfilling its sovereign capacity, is a state that respects other countries fulfilling their sovereign rights and embracing their self-determination, and we say that them actually remilitarizing isn't going to be the thing that offends them as a country. But then, we just have to point out that throughout this entire debate, they failed to engage with the principle. Because the fundamental principle we are proving here is that every single state should have the capacity to determine how it wants to protect itself, regardless of that outcome. We say that the process of you as a state deciding how you want to protect itself is something that is valuable, something that is important, and something that should be afforded anyway, regardless of your history. Because we say that states should not be bound by how it acted in the past. 
and you are doing this and suffocating Japan's ability with this policy. We said well, yeah. this is principally illegitimate. No, thank you. Second question we need to ask is, do we maintain peace and security? And the first thing that they tell us here is that militarization indicates that you want to prepare for war, indicates that you as a nation are intent on engaging in war. And we said that is completely untrue. We said that every single state throughout the entire world has a campaign where they build into intercontinental ballistic missiles, where they build able and air, like naval base, naval bases and an air force, and we say that this is no different. But secondly, we say they're lying about the balance of power, because they need to be listening to all of Rebecca's analysis which told you how the balance of power is largely skewed against against Japan. The fact that it has a northern neighbor that is building nuclear armaments. It's ridiculous to suggest that you shouldn't have a way of protecting itself. The fact that it has a country like China that feels emboldened to impose things like an East China Sea air, uh, air defense like identification zone where countries have to make themselves known to China before they pass through the Senkaku Jalu Islands. We say that in any scenario where war is likely to happen, it's under your context. Because here's where we need to interrogate the incentives of of nations. We say that if the security climate is largely skewed in your, in your favor, then you as a country are going to feel emboldened in being more aggressive, in being more violent. That's why China feels free to claim places like the Senkaku Jayu Islands, to claim islands in the South China Sea. We say that our policy restores the balance of power. How? Because here's where we're going to use their exact logic, right? Because if they tell us that China is currently Somalia. threatened by a strong military presence of the United States and Japan, then it's going to feel even more threatened by having Japan present in that scenario. It's going to become more cautious, it's not going to become more aggressive. Please tell me why I'm better. If any of this analysis is true, please would you account for the 70 years of peace we've had after World War II? Exactly, right? Because... <laughs> Sorry. We say that 70 years of peace can only exist under a climate where nations know that the consequences of war are going to be too great. And we say that's exactly what happened during the Cold War. Because even though initially Cuba threatened countries like the United States with things like brinkmanship, it, re it made these countries realize that the outcomes of war are going to be too great. And this is a process that can only emerge with remilitarization. And we say that Japan should have free will of deciding how it wants to deal with existential threats. And we say that you fail to respond to any of Rebecca's analysis which told you why Japan is important in the region as a power broker. Third question, do we involve in the relationship with the United States? And we say no, right? Because currently the United States is bound by an obligation to Japan based on these treaties, treaties that they talk about. Yet they don't have a willingness to actually maintain an active presence there, to actively understand the existential threats that Japan faces. Basis. We think that if Japan demonstrates a commitment to emboldening that mutual relationship with the United States, with helping them in being a power broker and being a buffer in the East China region, then the United States is going to be in more support of Japan, is going to make sure that they understand the threats Japan faces, we say it's going to bolster that security. You failed to rebut all of Alex's analysis, which told you why this is true, which told you why this is important. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to make peace, you have to prepare for inevitable wars I'm proud to the first.